a U.S. court has ruled that XRP, the asset, is not a security. In the words of the judge, Ripple sales of XRP do not constitute an offer of investment contracts. XRP, not a security. This is absolutely huge because if XRP isn't a security, then nothing in crypto is a security. Now, that's a little bit hyperbolic. Of course, it's possible to tokenize a thing that is a security and issue a security on chain. But what it does mean is the SEC's overreach, their regulation by enforcement, their allegations that Coinbase is an illegal securities exchange, their court filings indicating that Solana, that Filecoin, that Matic, that Atom, that Cardano, that all of these are securities. Well, how can they be securities if XRP isn't? How can ETH be a security if XRP isn't? This is important precedent that was just set and I think puts Gensler back on his heels. It's a step back for Gensler and for anyone in the SEC who thinks that this regulation by enforcement activity can continue. It's a check on their power. And uh, all of this came about, of course, from a multi-year court case between Ripple, which is the company that originated XRP and the SEC. We haven't talked about it much because it's been on the back burner for so long, but now here it is. This is a tweet from Bill Hughes. He is a crypto lawyer. He says this, the SEC versus Ripple. In brief, here's what you need to know. Ripple putting XRP on exchanges for trading and funding their operation with those sales is not an investment contract and therefore not a security. That's what the court said. Also, Ripple paying people in XRP is not an investment contract and therefore not a security. And XRP is not a security in and of itself, even when offered through a securities transaction. So this turn of phrase, investment contract, XRP is not an investment contract when it's on an exchange, if you pay people with it, or even when it's offered through a securities transaction. That's what the court ruled. However, the court did say that Ripple's original selling of XRP directly pursuant to contracts was an investment contract and thus a security. So originally XRP was a security and became not a security at some point in time. Bill also says, I'd, I'd be shocked if the SEC doesn't immediately appeal this to the second court because of course, this is a big setback for the SEC. I also agree with Adam Cochran's take here. He says, overall, this is a huge win. XRP is one of the more centralized foundations with a key figurehead who has had standard sales via exchanges and formal distribution programs. If those aren't securities, nearly nothing sold via exchange is. We also have some weigh-in from politicians. This is Representative Tom Emmer, Majority Whip. He's been on Bankless before. The Ripple case is a monumental development in establishing that a token is separate and distinct from an investment contract. Did you hear that, SEC? The token is separate and distinct from the investment contract it may or may not be part of. Now he says, let's make this law. Wants to take this court precedent and make it law, generally applicable. Representative Richie Torres on the Democrat side also weighs in on all of this with an attack against the SEC, saying the SEC is acting like an overzealous traffic cop arbitrarily ticketing drivers while keeping the speed limit a secret. It prefers to communicate by enforcement rather than by rules or guidance, but that's no way to regulate digital assets. I'm calling for an investigation of the SEC. So some heat from that as well. Uh, some of the major exchanges, including Coinbase, also issued within hours. Coinbase will be re-enabling trading for XRP on the XRP network. Uh, they say, I, I suppose they feel safe in doing this, given that the US court system has ruled that XRP is no longer a security. So that's what just happened. I'll uh, end with my take here, which is, this doesn't really matter what you think of XRP, the asset, or Ripple, the company. I personally think XRP is a, an overvalued project riding on some vapor writing on a, a passionate, some might say a, a shilly community. And I never thought I'd be saying this, all right? Thank you, XRP. You stopped Gary Gensler's onslaught against crypto because if XRP isn't a security, then almost nothing is. I'll end it there. We're gonna discuss this in more detail on Bankless in the coming days. I'm sure there's some things I missed here. This is breaking news. As I said, there's questions of whether Gensler and the SEC can appeal this. Uh, there's questions like, 
Is it clear skies ahead for security regulations in the US? I imagine there's some subtleties there. I imagine there's still some work we have to do. We'll get to all of those details. In fact, later today, I'm recording with Mike Selig. He's a crypto lawyer, and we're gonna explore this in some more detail. But today, for now, on the roll-up, this morning, we get to celebrate this win. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but thank you, XRP. Bankless Nation, it is the second Friday of July, and it is time for, of course, the weekly roll-up. I have Anthony Sassano from The Daily Gway with me for the second week in a row while David is up exploring some mountains, uh, and we got some topics to cover this week. Anthony, how are you doing this morning? I'm very good. I'm very bullish today, actually. <laughs> Wait, you woke up bullish? That's a thing you yeah. say on the Daily Gway, right? Like, so what, what constitutes Anthony waking up bullish versus all of the other days <laughs> of the year? I think I wake up bullish every day, to be honest. Um, it doesn't matter what the what the price is doing. I just wake up and you know I do my usual check Twitter routine, and I'm just like, you know what? I love this industry so much. I'm so bullish. <laughs> so you still have faith in this industry? You haven't given up on crypto? No, no, no. I mean, look, I, crypto to me is a broad term, right? Um, I obviously focus mostly on, on Ethereum, but no, I mean, everything that I'm seeing in the Ethereum ecosystem just every day, it's it's just crazy. I, I, I honestly can't keep up with it anymore. It's just, there's too much. Well, guys, if you want that bullish energy injected straight into your uh, veins, this is the place to get it. This is the weekly roll-up where we cover everything going on that you need to know about crypto. A few topics of the week. Uh, number one, to talk about this new marketplace for doxing crypto addresses. Is everyone in crypto about to get doxed? Some controversy surrounding a new bounty program that rewards people for doxing crypto addresses. We're going to get into that. Also, the Google Play Store, they just did an about face on their policy in a good way. Now NFTs are unbanned. They are allowed. We're going to discuss that as well. Aave is about to launch its new stablecoin as well. It's called Go. And is this the stable coin we've been waiting for, or is there another? Anthony, I want to pick your brain on that. As always, you got to make sure you like, subscribe, rate, and review. If you're on YouTube, subscribe. If you are listening to this on a podcast player somewhere, give us a rate and review, and let's propel this thing to the top of the chart. So much to cover in markets this week, Anthony. But before we do, a quick shout out. We are going to the Permissionless Conference. That is the Bankless Nation, David and myself. That is coming up on uh, September 11th through the 13th. So we're almost all the way through summer in the US and uh, it's time to book your ticket, guys. And I think the bear market is the best time to go to a conference. This is an opportunity to, uh, to network, to meet all of the settlers who stayed during crypto winters and to find your bear market buddy, as David and I like to say. Uh, a fire lineup. There's 120 speakers. We're expecting 6,000 attendees, 1,500 different crypto projects, and it's all in Austin. If you're a bankless citizen, you get a 30% discount. There is a link in the show notes to go do that. All right, uh, Anthony, let's get to the markets. Thanks to Kraken Pro for showing us these charts today. Bitcoin price, we're about flat since the last time you and I talked about this, about 30K on the week. Any takes on Bitcoin this week? I think, I mean, similar takes to last week, right, where I basically said that I thought that the market was trading just purely based on narrative, that ETF narrative. And I didn't expect any wild moves from here because of that, because there doesn't seem to be any new money coming in. And I think that's basically been playing out over the past week, but it's only been a week, right? You know, next week we could be, we could go up 10% for, for you know, that's the volatility in crypto. So yeah, I think just more of the same really over the last week. Well, uh, ETH is more of the same as well, kind of down a little bit, but pretty much flat. I'm just going to call it flat. 1880 mm -hmm. at the time we were recording this, which means, of course, the ETH to Bitcoin ratio is flat. The good news here is a uh, crypto market cap is over a trillion dollars. I don't know about you, Anthony, but that's kind of a meme number for me. Are we above a trillion or below a trillion? Of course, um, there are a lot of uh, tokens in this market cap that <laughs> maybe should be worth a lot less, but it feels good to be above a trillion. We are at 1.3 trillion on the week. Um, well, if there's nothing going on in the short run, or at least not much, we're waiting for the, the next price action. I want to zoom out a little bit, and I want to talk to you about three things in this market section. One is bonds. The second is staking in ultrasound money. And the third is real world assets. Uh, so let's start by talking a little bit about the bond market. And I want to do almost like a, a tale of two bond markets here because we've got the fiat bond market and then we have the crypto bond market and the Ethereum bond market. And I think there's a, an analogy 
that fits, that spans across both of them that I want to implant in listeners' head and, and get your thoughts on here. Um, first of all, when, when people say bonds, um, a lot of times it just sounds like this uh, obscure financial instrument, but what is a bond actually? A bond is just a form of debt. So when you buy a US bond, that would be a treasury, something to that effect, you're, you're essentially lending money to the US government. Uh, in the same way, when you buy a liquid staking token, we call these LSDs, or when you stake your ETH, you are lending Ethereum, the Ethereum protocol, some money. So that's why we call staking ETH or staked ETH a bond, essentially. It's an Ethereum bond. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, um, this infographic, Anthony, at any point in time, but this is what the global bond market looks like. And I'm going to describe some of this for listeners who are listening on the podcast. Um, this is all of the sovereign bonds it's about a $60 trillion market. So these are all of the bonds that nation states um, issue. So call these nation state bonds, if you will. Um, and $60 trillion worth of that, you know, $51 trillion is the US. Actually, these, these numbers are a little bit larger. So it's maybe this is 70 to $80 trillion. $20 trillion or so is China. And you can see all of the other nation states encompassing this pie. That's the size of the sovereign bond market. So I want to contrast the nation state bond market, which is about 60 to 70 trillion dollars or so to the network state bond market, which is only about 70 billion right now. And of course, uh, Ether, the asset, the bond composes the, the vast majority of that, about 40 billion or so. And then we've got Solana, we've got Cardano, we've got some other um, chains here, of course. So we've got a tale of two bond markets. And I, I was reading this report from Pantera earlier this week, Anthony, um, about the U.S. bond market. And t Pantera's perspective, they're, they're obviously they've been in crypto for a very long time, but their perspective is that the U.S. is totally screwing up its bond market, like turning it into a complete uh, Ponzi scheme. And one way you can see that is uh, this metric called the real Fed funds rate. Okay, so the real Fed funds rate. So what you can see on this chart is the Fed funds rate is basically the interest rate set by the Fed. Uh, that's sort of in yellow. That's this yellow line here. And then you see um, CPI. So core CPI, that is consumer price index, that is the measure of uh, a measure of inflation, is this dotted line. Everywhere where you see kind of red, the shading uh, pattern of red, that's where the Fed funds rate is below the core CPI rate. It's basically like you're buying a US bond, a sovereign bond in order to get a yield, say a yield of like 5%, but CPI, but inflation is like 8%, in which case, how much are you making in real returns, in real uh, Fed funds rate? Well, negative 3%. So you're kind of losing money on that. And it's very interesting, you see, like post uh, 2008, the um, you know the great financial the financial crisis here, um, it's been red basically ever since and up into it, it hit a high point I believe the lowest point of the year negative six point three percent that's the lowest in the last fifty years that the real return on um, on bonds have been on uh, essentially this Fed funds rate which is pretty crazy so you can start to see that the the case that this sovereign bond market is not actually producing a real rate of return. I want, I want to pause here because next we're going to contrast that with what's going on in, in crypto. Maybe we'll take a peek at the, the Ethereum bond market in some detail. Um, but what's your take on this, Anthony? Like, Who in the world is buying bonds right now? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I got to preface this and say, obviously, I'm not an expert on, on this kind of stuff. Uh, definitely uh, more of an observer. But it seems to me that the the COVID, I guess, response and COVID generally has distorted a lot of this because you can see it in in the chart, right? It, it seems to have distorted a lot of this, and and also post two thousand eight, um, as you were pointing out, how it was uh, it, rates were so low for so long, but then you can see that they were kind of trickling back up, and then COVID happened, and then back down again, right? And it's it's kind of funny how similar a lot of these charts look with COVID. Like there was the COVID dump, I guess, initially in stocks, right, and and crypto, and then we we went we went up after that um and because you know the rates were basically at rock bottom again and then the rates started going up and everyone got scared and and i guess like uh risk on um assets kind of went down 
Uh, but yeah, just generally, um, when, when you're talking about like buying bonds and getting that real return, I think that if you weren't in a bond and just in cash, obviously, and, and that's not cash in like an interest bearing account or something like that, um, you're losing you're even, even more. worse off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's kind of like, yes, you might be losing like you know, whatever it was 0.3%. Um, but you're much better off still doing that than just leaving cash lying around. But at the same time, you know, it's all about the appetite of, of investors, right? Like buying a, a sovereign bond, especially the US bond, is like the least riskiest thing you can do because you have the full weight of the US government behind that, mm-hmm. right? Like you literally, it's the you're buying into the US government essentially. So um, it's, it's considered the least riskiest thing you can buy. Uh, but at the same time, like, is it really like worth not taking on a little bit of extra risk to just get um, much more return potentially with your dollars, right? With with some risk assets such as a BTC or an ETH, right? Or or even a gold, which has done comparatively well. So yeah, it, it certainly begs the question is like, who is buying the bonds, right? Over over these other things. Well, what's interesting is part of the answer to that question is um, in, in a big way, banks. Uh, so central mm-hmm. banks are buying their own bonds. That's why Pantera is calling this kind of like a, a Ponzi scheme. So central banks mm-hmm. own about 50% of the sovereign bonds uh, that are out there. That's what quantitative easing is. So many of these uh, modern um, central bank policies actually do is they buy bonds on the open market. So that has kind of a distorting effect as well. But it's really interesting when you start to look at real returns, which is, okay, what's the yield of the underlying bond? But like you have to look at um, the yield minus inflation, right? That gives you your real return. Now let's contrast that to uh, Ethereum, which I think is is kind of interesting here. So remember, Ethereum is very much like staked Ether is like a bond. You are lending Ether to the protocol of Ethereum. And Anthony, when you were saying the risk-free rate, it's kind of the lowest risk type of um, you know, financial asset you can, you can have is owning US bonds or US treasuries. Staked ETH is the lowest, like, the the high, the high, highest yield yield it's almost like the risk free rate of ether as an asset right you can't deposit your ether anywhere else and expect to receive a, a return of any size at at lower risk so it almost represents the risk free rate here which is kind of cool and the contrast here is this to me looks a lot um i i'd call it healthier but because you don't have the the money printer um, the algorithm doing open market operations and purchasing staked ETH, like LSD tokens in the open market. That's what central banks do. Um, it's completely transparent. So you can see it kind of block by block. There aren't arbitrary decision makers who are adjusting the dials up or down. It just kind of follows um, the, the, the algorithm. And if you look at kind of, I guess maybe the comparison is uh, the real rate of return. And since, um, you know, since the merge, the real rate of return has been what, like something between four and six, or the actual rate of the nominal rate of return has been about between four and six percent. Uh, and then if you take the um, the burn uh, there, then you have to kind of like add that. So you're at like the burn since the merge has been 03 um, percent, and so the real rate of return looks far more attractive on a staked ETH versus sovereign bonds versus something like a a U.S. Treasury. And I just think this contrast is so stark and so interesting and does beg the question of like, if you are looking at any sort of time horizon, you have some extra capital and you're looking at a time horizon that's longer than like a year, let's say, why would you hold these um, sovereign instruments that are bleeding effectively? Like your real rate of return is going down when you can own an asset like Ether, uh, where, I mean, it's a, it's a positive rate of return. Now people say, but that's ETH denominated, right? It's not like, you know, real money, um, you know, but I, I don't know, I kind of go back to like, look over the longer time horizon, one ETH is one ETH. What, what are your thoughts on this and this uh, comparison in general, Anthony? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's generally a lot of things I could say about this. I, maybe the denomination thing is somewhere somewhere good to start. So yeah, when people say, oh, but you're, it's ETH and it's not US dollars, so it's completely different. 
the the way I think about stability generally is that, as you said, one ETH equals one ETH, one US dollar equals one US dollar, you know, one AUD equals one AUD. Um, but the thing is, is that like it's stable relative to itself. So if you start comparing a US dollar to your grocery bills, well, over the last two years, US dollar hasn't been very stable compared to your your grocery shop, right? Your grocery shop has gone up because there has been inflation and and because of um, uh, just prices generally going up because of supply chain constraints and all those sorts of stuff that happened because of COVID. Uh, and the same is true for any asset. You can compare any asset to any other asset. And that's where we come to things like stores of value. Like where do you store your wealth in order to protect yourself in the, in the most kind of like, I guess, risk-free or riskless way um, so that you're not taking on a massive amount of risk, like investing in a brand new company that has a 5% chance of succeeding or something like that. And traditionally it has been obviously the strongest currency, USD, which is the world reserve currency, or it has been gold uh, for a very long time. And then over, I guess, like the last I, I, I want to say 10 years, but probably less than that uh, in terms of BTC and ETH being, being considered stores of value. You, know, you can say five to 10 years, I guess. Um, it's been those assets, right? Where people say, well, you know, I can store the, my wealth in these crypto assets. I mean, I do it, you do it. Like we store our wealth in ETH and then we stake the ETH, of course, as well to get that return. And you were mentioning how it's, it's a real return. So when you stake your ETH, there are really... I guess three parts to it. You get a um, new ETH issuance um, that gets paid out to you uh, as a reward. You get the ETH bet that gets paid out as fees as a reward as well. Um, anything that's not burned, of course. And you get MEV related payments too if you're running the MEV boost software, which most people do. I think it's up to like 95% of validators are, are, are kind of talking to that software. So the the um the later two parts the 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 fee, the unburnt fees and the MEV that is not new issued ETH that is existing ETH that already exists in the Ethereum economy that is paid by users to do whatever on the network. The only new ETH that is issued is on that um, consensus layer side rewards, which is the 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 new ETH that is printed. But the thing is, is that we're burning more ETH than is issued. And we've been doing yep. this for quite a while now, especially since the merge, which means that the net result, as you mentioned, is that since the merge, we are at negative 0.3% uh, uh, inflation rate or issuance rate for ETH, uh, uh, the, the, the net rate. Um, and on top of that, it is much harder to print new ETH than it is to burn it because you have to basically outrun the burn. So even if the, the, the burn is really low, even if gas fees are quite low and the burn isn't actually um, you know, at 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 at, extra, uh, at um, uh, high amounts, it doesn't matter because you're still burning um, almost the same, if not the same, as what's being issued. So the issuance isn't actually increasing from that; it just basically stays flat. And that's what we've seen um, at at periods of time. You can actually see this on the chart. For the last few weeks, we remained relatively flat, with, with increasing slightly. But then we started burning more ETH again over the last, I think, couple of weeks uh, or, or so. Um, you can see, uh, yeah, over the, over the last thirty days, you can actually see how it worked out here. Um, and then we're just going straight back down because it's much easier to burn ETH than it is uh, to issue it. Now, of course, issuance changes as more ETH is staked, there's more ETH issued. Um, but still, I, I feel like the more ETH that gets staked, the more um, the more activity is happening on the network because people are using that staked ETH for different things like restaking such. So the, the fees will probably uh, level that out. Um, and yeah, all that just culminates in such a nice real yield on your staked ETH and a very, very attractive asset as a store of value. Totally. So you woke up bullish, Anthony. I woke up <laughs> bullish on staked ETH. Like it's just incredible. You got to look at the real um, return here and the real return of an asset like Ether when it's staked, when it's bonded is just uh, incredible. Um, I, I want to ask you another question because people listening to this section might also get kind of bullish and they have some ETH and they're like, okay, guys, I, I still haven't pulled the trigger. I still haven't staked my ETH. Uh, where should I stake it? How do you think about that question, Anthony? So there are a lot of different options in terms of staking ETH, including, by the way, um, all of these liquid staking uh, you know, tokens and options as well. So Bankless just put out a post about this, and there's a, a slew of new ones. Um, uh, Prisma, Swell, um, Unsh, ETH, Origin, Ether, Diva. There's tons of them. I can't even keep up with all of the new ETH staking protocols that are essentially innovating on the uh, the bond market by making some of these um, some of the staked ETH liquid, and that's really interesting. But for for the average listener thinking about how to stake, they could put their ether into an exchange, for example, a centralized location, and stake that way. 
Um, they could use a staking protocol, one of these new ones, or some of the established ones like Rocket Pool or, or Lido or something like that, or they can solo stake. Um, what's your take on that? Like, what advice do you generally give? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is that like, it, there's a bunch of different questions that you should be asking yourself uh, before putting your money into any of these things or before putting your ETH into any of these things. I think the number one question is like, how, how, how old is the protocol? Because security of the protocol and its smart contracts should always be top of mind because a newer protocol is going to be less secure than something that's older, that's been around for a while, that has been able to be battle tested. So that should be top of mind for everyone. Like, a, like particularly you know, these new ones, you're just a little bit like, well, oh, they don't have a Lindy, like, be careful. Exactly. I'd be more careful with them than say something like a rocket pool or a lighter that's been around for quite a while now. I would definitely be more careful with the newer ones. That's not to say that they're insecure or that they're going to get hacked or anything, but you need to be aware of that risk, especially when using newer protocols. And of course, older protocols can still have bugs in them, but it becomes you know less and less of a of a of a um, possibility or probability as as time goes on. Um, but on top of that, I would also say, depending on what kind of size you're staking uh, for these LSTs, if you're planning on on selling on secondary market when you want to exit this position, you should really uh, uh, be aware of what the liquidity is like for these LSTs because some of them, especially the newer ones, aren't going to have that much liquidity to start off with. So if you're putting in a substantial amount into these things, you may not be able to exit with the same amount you put in because you'll cause some kind of price slippage because you've got, you're just trying to sell too much at once or something like that. So that's something to consider. Um, the other things to consider, obviously, are, are you um, putting ETH into something that is decentralized or is, is going to be decentralized or are you staking with a centralized service? Are you staking with the dominant player? A lot of people say, well, you know, you shouldn't stake with Lido because they already have a very large market share. You should stake with one of these other players. And I, I definitely agree with that. But at the same time, you do have to consider these other questions that I brought up, especially around security and, and liquidity and things like that. And also the models of these things as well, depending where you are in the world, the, there are two different ways that these tokens, um, these LSTs can operate. They can either be rebasing um, uh, or they can be, uh, or they can pay you out um, uh, extra tokens as as rewards. So it rebases uh, or, or it can pay out, um, or, sorry, all the, the token price, uh, sorry, the token value increases with the rewards and that could have tax implications for you. You could owe tax uh, on that um, or you could owe tax on the rebasing one. It just depends on where you are. So that's another question to ask as well. So there are a lot of considerations here, um, but generally uh, I would run through all of those things before staking with anything really. Um, and then when it comes to solo staking, there are really just considerations uh, with solo staking of of a different nature because with solo staking, you're running the software. Um, if you're, you know, if you're buying an LST, you're not running the software. You're just buying the token. Someone else is running it. But as a solo staker, you are running all of the software. You are managing all the hardware. There is a lot more that goes into it in in that respect. You have all this, most of the same questions uh, around, um, around the things I just brought up, but you also have to worry about uptime. You have to worry about making sure that you are uh, are upgrading when there's an upgrade, like when there's an Ethereum network upgrade, upgrading your clients if there's a bug. How much work is uh, this? Because I know, I, I know you do this with solo staking. So like, yeah. um, all right. So per month, how much time are you spending kind of babysitting it? Uh, zero now. Um, honestly, once it's set up and going uh, and you know, you don't have like I guess any hardware issues where something breaks for some reason, uh, generally it's zero. And as I said, unless there's like a network upgrade that you need to upgrade your software for, uh, or there's kind of a, a bug or something, because you can set it up in a way where the the thing that you're uh, the um the the instance that you're running. So I run Linux. You can set it up so that automatically updates itself and then automatically reboots to install those updates. So you literally can be completely hands off and. It, it it really just depends as well because if something could go wrong like your internet going off or something and then you have to diagnose it right or, or or some other thing or something becomes corrupted but if everything's running fine then yeah the maintenance is 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 generally pretty low uh but yeah people people have different reasons for being actively ma actively maintaining it some people want to uh, optimize it as much as possible in order to kind of like get like near that 100% uh, uptime or something like that. So if you're not too worried about that and you're okay with 99%, then yeah, it's pretty much like hands off most of the time. Do you know the the thing that scares uh, me or a lot of people I think about this is just like the idea of losing your private keys, like locking yourself out somehow, Yeah, I was, right? I was gonna, mm -hmm, it, it, I was gonna like, mention that. How much yeah. of a concern is that? Like, so a lot of people listening, of course, to Bankless will um, have taken custody of their own keys and the wallet like MetaMask or a ledger or something like that, right? And 
that do, he, you have to know a little bit what you're doing before you go do that, right? If if I'm advising, say, my parents or something, I'm just like, yeah, dad, keep the money on Coinbase. Like it's you know, it's fine and, until you learn how to do private key management. How mm-hmm. much more technical do you need to be in order to safe safeguard your keys in a solo staking type setup? So the keys themselves, it's no more involved than than just uh, like doing a, a self custody kind of setup with a, a ledger hardware wallet or a, or a good plus or something like that, or even just uh, securing like your MetaMask seed, right? Um, that it's it's basically the same approach. Where it becomes a little bit more complex is that you have these validator keys that are on the I guess like machine that you have your validators on. Now, if that machine becomes compromised, so some, say someone hacks into it, they can't access your ETH because they don't have your, your private key and they don't have your, your seed phrase. But what they can do, and Vitalik has spoken about this, they can do like a, a thing where they slash you, they get you slashed, right? If they want to be malicious, they, they don't make any money from this, but if they want to be malicious and get you slashed, they could literally run your validator keys with their validator, right, on their, on their uh, software, um, and then do something that gets you slashed. Um, now, that... I don't think is a huge concern, to be honest. I don't think it's something the everyday person needs to be worried about. Especially well, the, the incentives for someone to do that is just, it would just be because they hate you. Like they're not yeah, gaining pretty, anything yeah. from this. They're just burning yourself down. It's like arson. Yeah. Yeah, well, pretty much. Yeah. So the it definitely the incentive is not there to do this at at kind of like a scale unless you like really hate someone or you really want to target someone. And the bigger players. I mean, you would think they, but they do generally, but you would think they have a better secure setup than, than just the smaller players, because some people will have a, have a, something that they've, that they've set up and they haven't secured it properly. But yeah, I mean, for, for someone to go in there and get you purposely slashed, they, they'd have to hate you or something. This is no benefit <laughs> for them to do that other, other than that. <laughs> Well, uh, very cool. Anyway, lots of options for for you to look into if you're looking at uh, at staking your ETH and uh, you know some some ramifications. But more options mm-hmm. is is always better here. Um, I guess in contrast to what I was just talking about about like no one buying uh, bonds. Here's a here's a headline from CoinDesk: Tokenized U.S. Treasury surpassed 600 million as crypto investors capture tradfi yield. So we are actually increasing in, in in crypto the tokenization of these treasuries and these sovereign bonds like us uh, treasuries past 600 million dollars is the latest number what are your thoughts on like tokenized treasuries and real world assets on chain do you have a general perspective on this trend yeah, I mean, this is the bridge, right? This is the bridge from from DeFi to to TradFi. I think that we've had real world assets be incredibly successful on Ethereum in the form of stablecoins for for very many years now. I mean, people forget that stablecoins are real world assets. USDT, uh, the first at scale stablecoin uh, that's that's absolutely massive, has been around for a very long time, and that is a real world asset. It has real world USD in a bank account that backs up the USDT. Same with USDC. And now what we're doing is that we're taking all these other assets and we're saying hey, we can bring these on chain as well. And then everyone around the world can get exposure to these things. Yes, they're KYC'd and AML'd and things like that as well. But I mean, I don't think that's necessarily something to to worry about or necessarily a bad thing. I think that that is just the way the old world operates and what, what the way that will continue to operate for, for various different reasons. But yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've talked about real world assets generally for quite a while now. And I said that they were going to be a, a main theme uh, in this bear market, especially, but also in the bull market, because... At the end of the day, everyone in crypto likes to call stocks like boomer things. But I mean, the young people still love stocks. Like it's not like the only people buying stocks are boomers. Uh, And (laughs) at the end of the day, a lot of young people, uh, even if they're not buying stocks directly, they're buying it through their 401k or their retirement accounts, right? So at the, at, at the end of the day, stocks, are like they're going to be popular. People are going to want exposure to it. Honestly, I would probably be more inclined to buy stocks if I could buy them using crypto rails than Same. traditional rails. It'd be so much more convenient <laughs> than using like my you know Schwab account or Fidelity or whatever else. It's just better, better infrastructure. Mm-hmm, exactly. Well, so yeah, just overall very bullish on, on real world assets. Well, I mean, to your point earlier, like, um, the, you know, I, I was disparaging, I guess, treasuries and sovereign bonds, but um, they are better instruments from a real return perspective than just holding the dollar relative to mm-hmm. inflation. And so when we have treasuries that are yielding like four to five, you know, percent, uh, and if you could tokenize them and hold them on chain, I'd rather hold a four five percent yielding treasury than uh, USDC if that was tokenized. Mm-hmm. It'd be really cool if, mm-hmm. if Circle or someone was able to come out with a product around this 
where we just ERC-20 sized uh, a treasury or a money market of some type. Of course, the um, the difficulty here is regulatory uh, headwinds that, that you face in mm-hmm. trying to do anything with tokenized securities. But this was the interesting report I, um, I saw this week, uh, which is the Bank of America is actually very bullish on real world assets, which is very interesting. And they say the expected value of tokenized asset markets could reach $16 trillion by 2030. That's in seven years. That's 10% of global GDP. I do think that real world assets are something like the Bank of America's of the world, like the banks can kind of understand. They both understand and probably can support it and appreciate it because it's the same um, financial instrumentation that they use. It's just on a new set of rails, on a new platform that's much more programmable. So I'll include a link to this report in the in the show notes, you can go check that out. See what the banks are saying about tokenized uh, assets. The last thing I just want to touch with you in the markets section here, Anthony, is um, correlation. Here, we spent a long period of time, I think, in you know, twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, with Bitcoin and other crypto assets being very correlated with uh, the S and P five hundred. So we just you're talking about like stocks as boomer instruments. We were trading just like those boomer instruments in crypto. Mm -hmm. And this like punched a hole in the narrative that I think crypto folks, particularly the Bitcoin community has been preaching, which is um, Bitcoin is a a non-correlated asset. It's kind of like gold. It's not correlated to, you know, Fed rates and what stock price does and all of these things. But for a a very long period of time, we were pretty correlated with stocks. Mm Uh, now that correlation has actually dropped. So we're back from something like um, a high of 0.76 correlation to about 0.1 correlation. So um, is this nature healing or do you have any takes on this? I've maintained for a while that even though these correlations are like this, that crypto likes to do its own thing, right? Crypto seems to follow its own cycles where it doesn't necessarily follow stocks uh, up or down. I mean, right now, I mean, stocks have been going wild for, for, for a little while now and crypto seems relatively flat compared to them, even though I think ETH is up uh, almost 2X since the start of the year or something like that, right? And B- BTC as well. But generally, you know, everyone's looking at stocks right now and being like, oh my God, every day, you know, stocks are going higher. The S&P 500 is going to hit a new all-time high soon. All these all, all these sorts of stuff, you know, a lot of these other tech stocks that got just obliterated uh, last year are coming, uh, coming roaring back. And I look at that and I'm like, yeah, okay, th- that's true. But at the same time, like, I don't think that there is that much correlation between stocks and crypto because you, and I think that the recent correlation was an anomaly. You can see the rest of the the time period here where correlations weren't that, um, weren't that that high um and i think if you look back at what happened last cycle the s p 500 was going uh was was going up and hitting new all-time highs uh for like i think a total of maybe at least 12 months um before crypto started really moving so it seems that the stock market was going to go up before crypto anyway uh it's kind of a, a leading indicator i guess for a number of different reasons i think the two main reasons are that um, crypto is more risk on generally than than stocks. Uh, even if you consider Bitcoin and Ether to be low risk assets, the majority of the world does not think that, right? Uh, they still think that BTC and Ether are highly speculative and, and very volatile, which they are. But to be fair, there's been a lot of tech stocks that were more volatile than ETH and BTC in this last cycle, which is which is funny. Um, and I think the second reason is that uh, generally what you what you kind of see in crypto market cycles is like this four year cycle. Right, that seems to follow the Bitcoin halvening, and I, I think that we're still respecting that. I think that maybe this might be the last time we, we respect that because there's going to be a lot more tradfi involvement in in uh, in uh, crypto than there has previously been, as we talked about last week with the BlackRock stuff and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the kind of second reason uh, that that four year cycle and that four year cycle points to next year being a really positive year because the halvening's next year and it's kind of it, it's it's right on smack bang four years since the last bull market. So at the start of the last bull market. It. So yeah, it it, it kind of seems to be following that still, uh, for better or worse. I think this chart too, when you look at the long term, is the case that you made last week for kind of ignoring macro in crypto, and that like mm-hmm. yeah, aside from I guess events in 2021 and 2022, crypto as an asset class hasn't been correlated to the S and P, and has not been very correlated to macro. And so, if that's the case, this chart is showing what we think it's chart showing. Then why not just ignore all of it? 
uh, which uh, maybe that could help uh, listeners filter out some noise in their minds when they think about uh, how to invest. We got a lot more to talk about though, Anthony, including crypto doxing. What happens when we have a new marketplace uh, for buying and selling information about any blockchain wallet address anonymously via smart contract? Also, there's a new developer report out uh, and uh, some developers are leaving. I want to talk to you about that and see if you think that that is uh, material. And lastly, the Google Play Store just had an epic unbanding of NFTs. And uh, maybe there are some people to thank for that. We'll talk about that too. But before we do, we're going to get to the sponsors that made this possible, including our number one recommended exchange, Kraken. Go check them out. Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning-fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out, join thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Okay, the question in my mind, is everyone in crypto about to get doxxed, Anthony? Let's talk about Arkham. This is a tweet thread that a, um, a project called Arkham released announcing the world's first on-chain intelligence exchange. You can buy and sell information on the owner of any blockchain wallet address anonymously via smart contract. You can see by the, the, the screenshot and the image of their, their interface, they have created an exchange of these bounties so if you want to identify a particular hedge fund or if you want to identify the owner of a particular Ether address, there are bounties for um, all of these data sets. And I guess a uh, community of sleuthers can go through and de-anonymize, identify who the owners of these addresses are. And there's lots of tools to do this, of course. Um, I think the government has their pulse on a lot of these tools and probably actively uses them in various prosecution types of cases. But what's your take on what Arkham has released? And, and by the way, they've been active for a while, so this isn't necessarily a new project. I think it's getting a bit more play because they're doing something with a token. But this whole idea of a marketplace, a bounty system to de-anonymize crypto addresses, like is everyone about to get doxxed? And what does that mean? Yeah, so I mean, I think generally people should understand that uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, I guess, as the two largest chains, and, and most chains out there are not anonymous, they're pseudonymous, right? Because everything is already public on the ledger. Uh, now, if you, if you look at it from that lens, what Arkham is doing here is they're basically just monetizing that fact, right? They're monetizing the fact that all that information is out there, all that information is ready to be uh, consumed and, and sorted and organized, but we just need to provide an incentive for people to do that. And you mentioned that governments have already been doing this. They do. Chain analysis is not uh, quiet or not, I guess, like secretive about the fact that they work with governments on this. And chain analysis has been doing work for a very long time now. I would I would wager that they have probably every single address on the chain doxxed at this point. They probably know everything about about Ethereum and Bitcoin at this point, just because they've been doing it for so long. And they do have big government clients for things like anti-money laundering. And they have big exchange clients too, I, I believe. So, the, so the, they the, have the, a database you're contending with uh, all I of mean, the different addresses out there. And then like 
identifiable names. Not maybe not all of them, but say like ninety eight percent. I mean, I would assume like that chain analysis is already de-anonymized or, or or kind of like tagged everything just because that is their job to do that, right? Their job is mm -hmm. to uh, categorize and sort everything out for one reason or another. Maybe they haven't got like names attached to these things, like I put people's names, but they have sorted it, organized it, and you could quickly just search it up. Like if you search an address on it, it'll probably be tagged with certain things and categorized in a certain way to make it easier to, to filter through. Um, uh, and ju just because that, that's their their main kind of like business, right? That's what they do. And they have government clients, they have uh, other clients out there that 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 request this information. But at the end of the day, like I can't be mad at chain analysis. I can't be mad at Arkham because it's really a failure on our, our, our <laughs> kind of behalf to allow this to happen, right? Okay. We allowed non-private blockchains to proliferate. And people have been going on about privacy for a long time now saying, you know, we need privacy by default because... It, uh, a privacy by default means that everyone is protected and there is no need to worry about these sorts of things. But because we don't have that, now you have Arkham coming along and saying, well, there's a business case here, right? There is a, a business case that we can slap a token on it and we can monetize this and we can do like bounties on things. And obviously it's it's highly immoral. It is not something that I consider to be a good thing. It's not something that I consider to be morally right. But but at the end of the day, um, you know, we're, we're building open permissionless systems. Morals don't factor in at that point because the permissionless system an open system will let you do whatever you want because, and, and it's decentralized too, right? So it'll let you do whatever you want. Um, and, and I think people grapple with that sometimes because their morals don't match the technology. And I think people have to understand that that's what we've created. And if you want it to improve, build better privacy tools that protect people. I know that obviously there was Tornado Cash and then that got sanctioned, right? So we did build a better tool. And then the US government came along and said, no, you can't use that anymore because of, uh, of North Korea really. And, that just makes it worse because it's like, okay, well, every day people want to protect themselves, but now they can't because the US government has said that we're not going to allow you to use this tool anymore. So that's why I'm saying it needs to be by default. It doesn't have, it, it can't just be an app. It has to be the entire chain is always private. No one can see what you're doing. Um, and I think maybe Ethereum gets there eventually, but it's more likely an L2 will do it before the Ethereum L1 will do it. And at the same time, it's not like we're going to be able to make everything that has already happened private. It just, it would start from, from that period of time onwards. Uh, so yeah, there, there are a bunch of different kind of things here. I think people have struggled to grapple with, uh, that they, they probably assumed that no one would build something like this or that they were okay. But at the end of the day, everything you do on chain is completely visible to literally everyone in the world. <laughs> and if you didn't know that now, you know, and this power yes. is no longer in the hands of just big governments. It could be in the hands of, of just about everybody. Um, Scott Lewis takes the counter of this. Um, Arkham Intelligence is techno-fascism. Of course, it's backed by Sam, a Sam Altman-founded company. The guy's building a dark and terrible future for humanity. We all get to choose whether we resist or submit. So calling kind of what Arkham is doing uh, basically evil. I think your point is a bit broader than that in that, well, if Arkham doesn't, didn't do it, um, you're like, more morality aside or ethics aside for Arkham specifically, somebody else would have. And so it's incumbent on us as a community to actually solve this. I'm, I'm wondering if you see any, um, I guess, upside to Arkham coming. Does, like, does it make us now think seriously about privacy? I can tell you, if like people are getting doxxed all of the time, I guess one negative effect is they might use crypto less Every, every, mm -hmm. if, if the, you know, the average person listening to this knew that all of their on-chain activity was, you know, fully, fully transparent and could be revealed at any moment by some uh, tool like, like Arkham publicly, not just to governments of the world, but just publicly, they might stop using our on-chain systems, right? I guess mm -hmm. on the, the, the flip side of that though, is that starts to create market value in actually solving the privacy problem. Maybe we start to get serious about privacy by default. Do you think this works out in our favor of the long run? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll say first that I do agree with with Scott here. I mean, I'm not in any way trying to defend Arkham and what they're with the, what they're doing. I, I do believe that it is uh, def definitely immoral and something that I don't want to see exist. But at the same time, like before Arkham, I mean, you can literally dox most people with just EtherScan because most people are not doing sophisticated hiding of their addresses and their funds. They're doing probably the bare minimum, and the bare minimum is maybe sending coins to an exchange, like washing it through 
an exchange to a new address. Do you know how easy that is to track still? Like it's not, it's not difficult to track that, but that's what people are doing as the bare, as, as the bare minimum. So generally like, uh, the, the, it's already kind of like happening. It's already been happening and people can follow EtherScan and, and, and dox these things. I mean, Scott, uh, Scott, uh, Zach XBT does this a lot, right? He uses EtherScan and similar tools to follow the funds of scammers and grifters with pretty great success. Wait, isn't right? that good? Like, so what, if we have privacy yeah. by default though, Anthony, we lose that, don't we? We, we do, but we gain a lot more, I believe. Um, I, I, I believe we we gain obviously privacy just generally, but we get we we gain the fact that people already have I guess like privacy privacy from just everyone in the world or everyday people uh, in the traditional finance system really most of the time like the people that see your transactions are I guess like the financial system itself and the people running the infrastructure, but it's not like everyone can see like it's not like everyone can see what I'm doing on my bank account for example right there is a kind of wall between those two things whereas with crypto there's no wall <laughs> there is literally everyone can see what you're doing doesn't matter if it's a government doesn't matter if it's uh, you know your neighbor. Uh, and that is definitely a problem. And to your point, I think that this problem coming to the surface a lot more will spur on more of this activity. But there are, already has been a lot of this activity and there already is a very promising layer two called Aztec Network being built out that is going to be private by by default. And they're building what they're call, calling an encrypted blockchain where basically everything on there is encrypted and private. So it, it's already happening. But yeah, I, I can see that over the long term, this could definitely spur a lot more research and a lot more development into this space just by virtue of people being aware of it. Because I don't, as I said, I don't think a lot of people are aware of the fact that anyone with Eat the Scan can, with pretty great, um, I guess, like odds, dox all of your addresses if they wanted to. Yeah. And one thing that I'll add to this is I don't see um, Ethereum mainnet adding privacy by default anytime soon on the layer mm -hmm. one, right? We will probably have smart contracts that do sort of mixing type things, tornado cash style. We'll have layer twos that add privacy by default as a feature, but layer one will not be, like mainnet will not be privacy by default. I, I haven't seen any pursuits in that direction. Um, all right, well, let's talk about another report that uh, that came out this week, which is a developer report from Electric Capital. Anthony, it's uh, looking like some of the devs are leaving, actually. So we are down 22% in dev activity and contribution from about a year ago. Should we be alarmed by this? I mean, it depends where they, they're, they're down from, right? It depends what ecosystem, I guess, they're down from. Because if you're measuring from June of last year, then you're measuring basically the depths of the bear market, the second half of last year, right? Where where everything was was blowing up. So many things are blowing up. And then you had FTX blow up. And all of these narratives that were formed in the bull market, especially around these kind of like uh, layer ones, right? That, that went crazy during the bull market. We came off of that. So it, are these developers basically leaving from those ecosystems um, because they only got involved because there was money flowing, there's, there was developer incentives, things like that? I think that's more likely the, the reason because it actually isn't that um, hard of a fall. Only losing 22% when we went we're, when we um, basically went through a brutal bear market, but we're much higher than we were from the last bull, uh, bear market uh, where, you, where you can see here on, on the chart. Um, and as I said, I, I feel like most of the developers probably left from the uh, ecosystems that have just stunted in growth, right? That have just stopped growing altogether. Um, whereas Ethereum and the layer twos kept growing, right? So I, I, I wouldn't imagine that a lot of those were from there, but, but just like users, there are tourist developers, right? There are yeah. people who only come during the good times. And then they're like, oh, well, I'm pivoting to AI now, right? So I think there's a, a lot of that going on too. Yeah, I, I agree with that take. My take is it's healthy. And if you look at this chart, which is actually 2015 up until now, and number of monthly developers. If you if you were to view this chart in log rather than linear, I'm sure this looks similar to 2019 and, and 2020. 22% drop off is probably about what we needed uh, at this point mm -hmm. in time. Um, this was pretty big this week. Google Play changing their policy and allowing NFTs in apps and games. The reason I love this, Anthony, is because I also think it puts pressure on Apple uh, to do the same. Mm -hmm. And so we have, of course, these um, th these app stores, uh, Apple and uh, Android and, and Google. Um, they could be gatekeepers to what sort of wallets that are issued inside of the mobile ecosystem, or what what sort of NFT games we have. And this is Android saying, "Hey, we're uh, opening up. Uh, we are going to enable um, NFTs 
in apps and games, we're not going to charge an additional fee. And I think this puts pressure on Apple to do the same. Any other th- takes on this? Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I think I'm I'm well aware of the fact that people like know about this duopoly, right, between Google um, and Apple when it comes to app stores and how they ha- it can exert some pretty big control over things. And people want to break that as well. They want to basically create a maybe a new ecosystem that is outside of Apple and Google. But I think what people miss is that not only is creating a new ecosystem for mobile incredibly difficult, and there have been multiple big companies like Microsoft that have failed to do this, you not only need to do the software, on, uh, you also kind of need to do the hardware. And doing the hardware is even harder than doing the software side of things. Mm-hmm. So when you take all that into consideration, it's much better for us to focus our effort on basically not forcing, but encouraging forcefully uh, Google and Apple to allow these things to exist, right? To allow these things to exist on their respective app stores because bootstrapping a whole new ecosystem is a pretty, I would say, impossible task. I I don't think it's something that should be pursued. And I know that Solana had an initiative recently with Solana Phone to do this. I I said it then and I'll I'll say it now. I don't think that's really going to go anywhere. Um, I don't think anyone's going to buy a Solana phone over an iPhone just so that they can use a new ecosystem uh, and and kind of like get access to apps they wouldn't be able to get access to on on the Google Play Store or or App Store. The vast majority of people, 99.999% of people, do not care about that. So let's not service the micro niche kind of thing of crypto. Let's service the, the rest of the world. And as I said, I think our energy is better spent making sure that we can get these apps approved and enabled on these uh, these existing app stores. Anthony, not bullish on the Solana phone, but that didn't stop Anatoly from taking some <laughs> uh, He said, this wouldn't have happened without Solana up. Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> going to take 100% credit for shifting multi-trillion dollar titans of industry. So making the case that because crypto provided another option. No, but, uh, no, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's, that's a, a very bold stretch. take. Yeah, we, yeah that's there, a, there that's is a very take. little adoption right now of uh, Solana Mobile. But um, anyway, you know, cheering them on. This is yeah. a this is a good this is definitely a good um, step forward for for crypto and something we need having the Apple or the Google Store open up. So let's see the same from Apple. Uh, Anthony, we got a lot to talk about coming up next, including Ave's new stablecoin that's about to hit the market. Is this the one we've been waiting for? A uh, brand new ZK EVM hits the market as part of Layer 2 Summer. There's a lot going on in Layer 2 world I want to talk to you about. Also, Brazil with a um, central bank digital currency on Ethereum. I saw something about this. I want to dig into it some more. And the UK, they are turning crypto friendly. What does that mean for us? Guys, we'll be back with all of that. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. You know Uniswap, it's the world's largest decentralized exchange with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume. You know this because we talk about it endlessly on Bankless. It's Uniswap, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap Labs just released the Uniswap Mobile Wallet for iOS, the newest, easiest way to trade tokens on the go. With a Uniswap wallet, you can easily create or import a new wallet, buy crypto on any available exchange with your debit card with extremely low fiat on-ramp fees, and you can seamlessly swap on Mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. On the Uniswap mobile wallet, you can store and display your beautiful NFTs, and you can also explore Web3 with the in-app search features, market leaderboards, and price charts, or use Wallet Connect to connect to any Web3 application. So you can now go directly to DeFi with the Uniswap mobile wallet. Safe, simple custody from the most trusted team in DeFi. Download the Uniswap wallet today on iOS. There is a link in the show notes. Layer 2 Summer is here. Three things uh, to know. I think the first is this. Consensus is launching a Layer 2 on mainnet. Um, This is an alpha release right now. It's a ZK EVM. It's called Linea. Uh, Anthony, what do you know about this 
what consensus is building. Is this just another layer two joining the ranks and like, welcome, uh, great to have you? Or is there anything special about this particular layer two? Um, it, it, it's relatively new, so I haven't dug into it too much myself and I haven't seen much uh, much about it uh, 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 recently. But yeah, I mean, it's another ZKVM joining the ranks here. Obviously, as you said, from Consensus. Consensus have been around for quite a while now. They're the developers of products such as MetaMask and, and Fura that, that everyone uses pretty much. So yeah, they have a, a, a track record of, of launching products and, and maintaining them for, for long periods of time. So I'm curious to see where they go with this because I think that the general generalized L2 market is becoming very saturated very quickly at this point. It seems like we have more block space than apps at this point. A good um, problem to ha and, have, I guess. Yeah, definitely. It, but it does begin to feel like what we saw with like the L1s, right? Where there were yeah. so many of these L1s launching, they all looked pretty much the same. They <laughs> yes. had their own claim to fame, but at the end of the day, people just wanted more block space, right? They wanted those cheaper fees and and and, and not not wanted to pay Ethereum mainnet fees. But I'm I'm still excited for it. I'm still excited to see these things blossom and and basically play it out in the market. You know, battle it out, see which ones people actually want to use and which ones can survive and thrive, and which ones just go by the wayside. Yeah, that's just it. I I love the competition. I think it's going to level us all up. Uh, and here's another competitor that's entered the fray from Mantle Network. Um, this is a layer two developed by. BitDAO, their thing is they're going to uh, use Eigenlayer as uh, the data availability layer. So fees will mm -hmm. be super cheap. Maybe this allows them to optimize on user experience, you know, uh, really fast smart contract wallets, uh, low cost. Um, the news this week was they are launching a eco fund, Mantle, BitDAO is from, from Mantle of uh, $200 million investing in the Mantle ecosystem. And what I think is interesting about this is um, this comes from BitDAO. I don't know if you've uh, followed BitDAO, Anthony, but um, they maintain one of the largest treasuries, on-chain community mm -hmm. treasuries of any DAO, including $500 million worth of ETH, uh, $2 billion total treasury. A lot of those are Mantle tokens, but $500 million in ETH. That's quite the war chest to be mm -hmm. investing into this uh, layer two. So another competitor throws its hat in the ring and um, I think it's kind of cool. Um, mm -hmm. Lastly, Gitcoin is releasing a public goods layer two as well. A public goods layer two. What's going to be different about this one? Yeah, so so these are the kind of things I guess I get a bit more excited about because they're specializing, right? They're not just trying to be another generalized L2. They're actually specializing. And in Gitcoin's case, they're specializing on public goods. This has been their bread and butter since day one, right? They've been doing this for quite a while now. And the way I'm kind of envisioning this is that you want to have an ecosystem that develops around public goods, but you don't want it to be necessarily fragmented, right? You want to be able to have it in kind of a, I guess for lack of a better term, centralized place where people can kind of interact with uh, all these different public goods applications. They can do payments on this chain. They can have like some light DeFi. You'll have a Uniswap on there because people will obviously want to swap tokens uh, when they're doing these sorts of things. But having it all in the one place and having these protocols be able to integrate with each other and cooperate with each other in a really close knit way and being aligned to grow the public goods network together, I think is just speaking to Gitcoin's core values and what they've been trying to do for a long time. And also something that I, I'm incredibly bullish on because it, it differentiates itself from the competition, right? From, from the pack. Um, and, I, and as I said, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's trying to compete with the other L2s either. It's more of a compliment. It's like, Hey, you know, you want to do some public good stuff instead of having to go to you know, all these other different ecosystems, you can just go to public goods network and here you go. You can find your your home on there. You can find uh, cool things to do, find really cool things to fund and, um, and, and DAOs to join and things like that. And I really do think that probably the biggest thing that's going to come out of this is that there's going to be a network of people that join the public goods network and basically uh, become the governors of many different protocols out there. And they call the public goods network their home, but they're governing apps on Arbitrum and Optimism and, and you know, Polygon and all these other chains. And they come home to public goods network. That's their hub where they kind of coordinate and 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 do all this stuff. So yeah, I, I'm pretty excited about it. Do you worry at all about fragmentation with all of these different layer twos? Like we kind of just get too fragmented, can't keep up. There's no one single source for kind of state and we just become diffuse. I, I think I worry about fragmentation, not on the 
technical or kind of economical side, but more on the, on the social side of things where mm. humans will generally stick to something longer than they should a lot of the time. Um, you know, especially if it's something that they've founded or if they're very close to, and we've all had this experience where we hold the crypto token down way too long because we, uh, we, you know, we can't cut our losses, so to speak. So I think that from a technical point of view, interoperability is, is pretty much solved with these bridges um, that we have now. And same with the economic side of things where you can just bridge assets between chains relatively easily. But on, a, on the social side of things, what's going to happen is that you're going to have these L2s that exist for quite a while because they're going to have a massive war chest from issuing tokens, things like that. And they, they'll they be like these L1s. They're basically zombies, but the social capital is still there because people are still getting paid. They don't want to cut their losses on it because they're like, this is a cushy job, right? It's like dying corporations. It's the same thing. Like they're, they're around, there's money coming in um, and then they just stick around for way too long. So I worry about that. But at the same time, I think over the longer term, it fixes itself anyway, as we've seen with the layer ones. Over the longer term, everyone just comes home to roost on Ethereum. You know, they mm. they go, they 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 abandon these other layer ones, they come home to Ethereum, and Ethereum grows. Ethereum becomes a better ecosystem because of it. So I think with the L2s, it's going to be the same thing. There's going to be a bunch of them that don't work out, they just exist as zombies. And then the people from there eventually will come to the to the other L2s that are succeeding and kind of like you know, migrate. It's it's like it's like the, the countries around the world. You migrate from a country that you believe doesn't have an economic future for yourself to one that does. It I think it's a similar kind of thing, but you usually wait too long to do that a lot of the time. And this is like an immediate threat. Obviously, war, uh, war in the real life is an immediate threat and you move. But if it's if it's a slow burn, you tend to wait longer because it's yeah. a, it, you, you're, you're, you're kind of like stuck in that ecosystem for one reason or another. So I think that's what I worry about the most, but not the technical or economical stuff. That's much easier to solve than social stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And, and to your point, you and I were just laughing uh, before the show began on the Kraken charts, the top gaining tokens this week were things like um, Kin, uh, you know, mm. P O W R, right? These tokens that are still around and y you wonder, um, like, it seems like tokens in crypto can never die. And it's probably for the mm. reason you just said, they'll just be around forever. They might not grow and they might have this one weird breakout day where suddenly they're up 30%. Um, but they just don't fully collapse to zero, do they? No, no. And and I, I, it's kind of funny because you can always find at least one, there's always one, I don't know why, person who's still holding a bag <laughs> of an old one true token. believer <laughs> yeah. i i remember in the bull market towards the end someone was shilling feather coin in my twitter uh, replies <laughs> feather coin is from like 2013 or 2012 like a it's like serious a believer coin yeah yeah someone's serious being like oh the team's coming back they're gonna reinvent <laughs> the thing and i'm like what? wow what is going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know you can't um, can't destroy the faith of uh, human beings. I guess sometimes. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've got the uh, a new stablecoin from Ave. It's called Go. This has been talked about for a while. This is a proposal on the governance of form of Ave to actually launch this thing. Go is an algorithmic stablecoin, so you can mint exactly a dollar worth of tokens when there's a dollar worth of um, you know, cryptocurrency. And it's minted against a diversified set of assets that are in Aave. To me, this is very similar to DAI. I don't know what your take is on it. But um, high level question, is it go time? I mean, is this the decentralized <laughs> stablecoin we've been waiting for? What are your thoughts on this? I have uh, a lot of thoughts on decentralized stablecoins generally. And I guess the TLDR of my thoughts is that I don't think we're ever going to have one that actually works at scale. Um, because when you think about it, and I was talking about stability earlier in, in the episode, right, where I was basically saying you're measuring stability against something else. If you have a, a decentralized stablecoin that is pegged to fiat, I mean, it, it, in my mind, it's not decentralized really because you're pegging it to a centralized asset, right? Even if it's only backed by ETH and even if it's got no governance attached to it and it's like completely just existing on Ethereum uh, as in a decentralized state, it's still pegged to the US dollar. So when, if that's the case and if you're collateralizing it to, to mint it, you're limited as well in, ter in terms of scale by the collateral. So you're limited, if even if you're just using ETH, you're limited by ETH's market cap. And that's the upper limit. The real limit is much lower than that because obviously not all of the ETH is going to go back in your, your stablecoin, right? Even if it's uh, an LST, for example. But as soon as you do LSTs, it doesn't become decentralized anymore. Like if you're backing with STETH, that's not a decentralized asset anymore. STETH is centralized with, with Lido. So 
if you're just using ETH as the example here, your ceiling for how much you can issue is very, very low. It's it's super low compared to the ETH market. I would say you could get to 10 billion or something, 10 or 20 billion. So that's no, nowhere near enough to service the whole world, right? As a decentralized stablecoin. Okay, so if we run along that path, well, then how do we make it bigger? Well, we make ETH's market cap bigger. Okay, how big does ETH's market cap have to be? Well, it probably has to be a hundred trillion plus dollars in order to issue enough of this it, stable In which coin. case, ETH becomes the stable coin? Exactly, you knew exactly <laughs> where I was going with it. In which case, ETH becomes the stable coin. So right. in my mind, these things are good in like little kind of niche areas and maybe just for the crypto economy to play around with and use. But the end state of, of a decentralized stablecoin really is just ETH. ETH is going to be the decentralized stablecoin if it succeeds, if it gets to a large enough market cap. Because as I said, it's it's stable to itself, but then if it becomes stable relative to everything else in your life, your expenses, groceries, bills, whatever, then why wouldn't you use ETH as money. People use things as money when they're stable relative to what they're trying to purchase with it. Just like people in hyperinflationary countries, they want to purchase USD because USD is way more stable than their currency, right? So it's going to come to a point where ETH is way more stable than their currency uh, and probably in far into the future at this point, but you purchase that and then you just use ETH as your decentralized stable coin. So your take is you like you like Go, it's cool, but um, yes, yeah. to assume it'll have more success than something like Dai is you know probably overstating it. It's it's going to be sort of a, a niche stablecoin for crypto enthusiasts, not nearly as scalable as, as something like a USDC or a Tether at this point. And um, you're pessimistic on the overall ability for us to get a true decentralized stablecoin out there, and so fiat-based stablecoin, yeah, yeah, fiat yeah like something coin. that's pegged to to fiat and, and I think that's what I think that's what history has shown so far. So we'll see if uh, Go can be different. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of cool to see some innovation here. Uh, Eigenlayer has just reopened as well, so the LST restaking cap has been increased from nine thousand six hundred to thirty thousand staked ETH. Um, Anthony, are you going to restake anytime soon or are you going to wait on this one? So I don't hold any LSTs because I am a solo staker and a Rocket Pool node operator. So node operators in Rocket Pool don't get the RETH. They um, basically um, just uh, obviously uh, there's a there's a kind of pool. I'm not going to explain the whole Rocket Pool protocol, but they the, the node operators don't get the RETH. The RETH is given to the people that are putting ETH in a deposit pool, which matches the Rocket Pool node operators. You guys um, just so meant the RETH to, as a node operator, right? Yes, yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. That's mm. that's probably the correct terminology there. So for me, I don't have any LSTs because solo staking rocket pool i don't um own st or anything you could like always that, so buy not, some anthony just buy some uh, to stake i i could restake. i could but right now right now outside of farming and potential uh, possible airdrop which is what i think a lot of people are doing right now i don't see the point because there's nothing really live yet for eigenlayer it's it's literally just deposit these funds here um and they're doing this as a bootstrapping mechanism obviously you can't have things go live using restaked eth if there is no eth that's being <laughs> restaked right so that's what they're doing here but they are going to have like uh native restaking as well as they've listed here where you can change your withdrawal credentials from your solo validator to eigenlayer i'll probably do that when there's something Thing that's actually live rather than than this because i'm not interested in farming any potential airdrop or anything like that um and it is as i've mentioned before anything new is always risky so i, I definitely take that very seriously especially when it comes to my staked eth i'm very protective of my stake <laughs> that's why I, I solo stake but um yeah i i actually think this is really, a really cool way of bootstrapping right just getting raising that tvl cap doing a guarded launch and then eventually launching their products like the eigen data availability layer which you mentioned before which i think is one of their first products um and then harnessing what's already been uh staked or restaked and and using that to secure these things yeah i i agree so if you want to be on the frontier of course you can uh put some eth in there um, but uh, definitely don't feel like you should be pressured into that. There are risks associated with it. Um, I don't know if you've been following this, but Vitalik did a, a Twitter Spaces. Um, and here's a quote from a, a Cointelegraph article. Vitalik Buterin says, ordinals have revived Bitcoin builder culture on uh, Bitcoin. He said um, later, he, pr he praised ordinals and the BRC20 token standard. He said, ordinals are starting to bring back a culture of actually doing things. Feels like there's some real pushback to the laser-eyed movement, which is good. I think he was talking to uh, Udi Wertheimer and, and also um, uh, Eric, uh, who are, I think, well-known um, 
Bitcoin revolutionaries, let's say, in the kind of <laughs> bi- Bitcoin is almost having a, a cultural revolution type of uh, moment where there's sort of this this builder community that's starting, and then there's the laser eyed maximalists who don't want to do any of that. Do you have any weigh ins here? Do you think uh, Bitcoin culture is, is getting any better? Do you pay any attention to this? I pay a bit of attention to it. I think it is definitely, I guess, the most interesting thing to happen in Bitcoin in a while, which says a lot considering that Ethereum was doing this in 2015. Um, So like doing tokens and NFTs, which is basically what ordinals are. I will say that I actually side with the laser eyed maxis in this case. Um, And that's not something I usually say. Yes. Oh, I think Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin doesn't need any of this. I don't think Bitcoin should be doing NFTs. I don't think Bitcoin should be doing tokens because it is literally just a budget store, a dollar store Ethereum. It's not doing anything better <laughs> than Ethereum. So, well, so why all are Bitcoiners you comp- are going to hate you for that on both sides? <laughs> no, yeah, I think so. But like, why are you compromising on what makes Bitcoin special sure. to do things that you can just do on Ethereum and even other chains that already have existed for quite a while. And people will say, oh, because Bitcoin's more secure, you know, it's got a lot of capital there, we can harness that, and there's a different culture. I I get that. But at the same time, like, I, in my mind, Bitcoin is no longer what it used to be. Bitcoin has changed now, right, fundamentally. So I think people are going to look at that and be like, okay, well, Bitcoin is not this unchanging uh, thing that we can kind of store our value in and be certain that it's going to be very similar, if not the same in 10 years as it is today. You're not going to know what Bitcoin's like in 10 years because this functionality was actually introduced on accident with the Taproot upgrade. No one, uh, as far as I know, knew that this was possible using Taproot. So if something can be introduced via accident like this, what's to say it's not going to happen again? So for me, it basically adds a cloud of uncertainty to Bitcoin that didn't exist before. So that's why, and that, and I think that's the argument that, that the laser-eyed maximalists make, even though, I mean, I disagree with them on pretty much everything else. I think they're right in that Bitcoin should not be going down this path because because at best, it becomes a dollar store version of Ethereum, right? You just um, see it as like b- building on Bitcoin is just like, you know, TI-83 calculator. It's just like compared yes. to a computer. It's just like shitty Ethereum. So like why go down that uh, path at all? But at the same time, like for the laser ad maximalist, you can't really stop it. Can you? No, I mean, you like can't. You can't stop open, it. No. All of the, the tweets and the kind of the vitriol and the, you know, jihad you, you wage internally, it's not going to stop builders from building on Bitcoin if this is a permissionless protocol and they have the ability to do it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And I, I I don't fault anyone for building on there. And and I, I do agree with Vitalik that it revived some kind of builder culture on Bitcoin. I don't think a lot, to be honest. I think that there's there was a short term kind of maybe three months or so of it going kind of crazy because it was this new thing. Everyone loves the new things, right? Um, and then it seems to have tapered off a bit. But at the same time, as I said, like it fundamentally changes what Bitcoin is in my mind. Bitcoin is no longer what it what it used to be. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people in the Bitcoin community, not just the laser eye people, but generally Bitcoiners um, that don't like this, that feel like Bitcoin has, has changed too much. And if these changes continue and if it keeps changing, I don't know what that's going to look like. Is there going to be another civil war? Is there going to be another split between the Bitcoiners, right? Like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin in 2017? I'm not sure. There's something happening. It's uh, it's certainly, if nothing else, it's uh, entertaining to see what's going on. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, uh, definitely. Vital- Vitalik weighing in is interesting. Uh, just to conclude the story we talked about from last week. So the Winklevosses were saying they would, would sue Barry if he didn't return mm-hmm. all of the, the hundreds of millions, the 640 million he owes. And uh, indeed, they, they did sue Barry uh, Silbert and DCG. Of course, uh, the statement from DCG Group is that this is yet another publi- uh, publicity stunt from Cameron Winklevoss to deflect blame and responsibility from himself and Gemini. Uh, we haven't done anything wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Back and forth, back and forth, as you'd expect, Anthony. Um, so that's where that is. Um, also, this was interesting this week. The former SEC chair, Jay Clayton, thinks that we should get a spot Bitcoin ETF. Um, His reason was this. He said, when the SEC approved a futures-based ETF, they said, let's look at the future market. We see their surveillance. We see the protections in that market for the investor that are sufficient. We don't see them in the spot market. So we're going to make that distinction. He said, there should be no distinction. If you're going to approve a Bitcoin futures ETF, which has been approved, then the SEC should also approve a Bitcoin spot ETF. I still think we're going to get a Bitcoin spot ETF this year. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that a, a couple of years ago, but I, th- I sort of confirmed it. This um, 
fantastic podcast with a, a kind of an e- ETF expert at, at, um, at Bloomberg. And he went through sort of all of the various scenarios. He tracks all of the different ETFs for approval. There are like 77 different crypto ETFs in some state of either denial or approval. And he thinks that this year could be the year, and if not this year, into January for a couple of reasons. One, there's this grayscale court case where uh, GBDC and Grayscale are essentially suing the SEC saying, hey, we should be allowed to convert our trust into an ETF type structure. This is, you know, there's no reason for you not to approve that. So that's going through the court system. Some legal analysts are saying a, a verdict could be delivered by September. Obviously, that would be a big game, game changer. And then, of course, you've got BlackRock uh, coming in here and Fidelity and some of the others continuing to apply pressure on Gary Gensler and the SEC. So I feel like he's got to bend. I feel like politically he's got to give something. And so that's mm-hmm. why I think a, a Bitcoin ETF is going to happen this year. So uh, I know we've talked ab- about that a little bit. Uh, last thing I want to get to, though, is London and the UK becoming a place maybe for American crypto refugees. The prime minister of London, uh, Rishi Sunak, he seems to really like crypto, Anthony. Um, do you have any takes on like jurisdictional arbitrage? And it always seems like someplace around the world is either cooling or warming up to crypto. And right now, the UK seems to be warming up to crypto. Do you think we'll get some crypto projects over there, some favorable regulations some crypto natives maybe moving in that direction? Yeah, I mean, I think so. If the US continues down this path, right, of just being hostile to crypto, it's, it, it will just naturally happen. I think that the UK generally, from what I've seen, is trying to reinvigorate their economy after leaving the EU, which seems to have turned out to be not that great of a decision. Uh, so they seem to be trying to, <laughs> yeah, reinvigorate their economy, grow their economy. And it seems that, I mean, Rishi seems a lot younger than the politicians we're used to, especially in the US, right? So he may be, have a favorable outlook on crypto because he probably understands it better just from from a fundamentals point of view so i think yeah it, he seems to be pushing it uh the yeah the uk seems to be putting in those regular regulatory guard ro- rails that regulatory clarity that the us doesn't have that should logically attract a bunch of teams but as we we're talking about before about switching costs right and how people can can stay in one place for way longer than they need to and they don't cut their losses i think the same thing's going to happen i think there's going to be a lot of us based crypto teams that are just going to stay put because they'll be like no things will change you know just give it a couple of years we'll get more regulatory clarity and we'll probably end up just seeing that existing people that live in London or the UK will probably just start crypto businesses there that maybe otherwise wouldn't of because they have more clarity now on, on that front. Yes. And hopefully this this puts pressure on other jurisdictions and maybe the US in particular to become a bit more uh, crypto friendly. So that is definitely the, the bull case for that. Um, this caught my eye as well, Anthony. I don't know if you've uh, followed this at all, but a pilot project of Brazil's, a central bank digital currency, apparently it was um, deployed to Ethereum, I believe. The uh, mm-hmm. the tweet thread here says, um, of course, the central bank digital currency, Brazil's currency, it can be frozen at any time. You'd sort of expect that for any nation state deploying a central bank digital currency to um, have the ability to freeze various transactions or block various transactions. I'm not super surprised at that, but um, deploying this on a public network, and again, this is probably just a prototype, it's just a pilot, it's just a test. Um, Do you think that Ethereum will be the recipient of central bank digital currencies of ERC-20s? Is it a net gainer in a world where central banks all have their own digital currency? Or um, do you think most central banks will not deploy on a public blockchain? They'll you know, kind of create their own blockchain digital apparatus the way uh, China is doing. Yeah, so I, I think with the Brazil one here, what they want to do is create a private fork of Ethereum, sort of like an intranet for their CBDC, right? Um, so in that world where let's say all the central banks around the world do that, I could imagine Ethereum as that interoperability layer, right? As that internet to the intranets, so to speak. So that's where I see Ethereum playing a big role where they'll probably use the ERC-20 token standard just because it's widely accepted. And then it'll be easy to interoperate between these different kind of ledgers, these private ledgers and the public ledger. So that's where I, I see them meeting. At the same time, I'm not exactly very bullish on CBDCs for the reasons you outlined, obviously the massive centralized control that they exert. But at the same time, people will say that they're not 
bullish on these things and I don't want them to exist. But currently, both USDC and USDT have the same freeze function in them. At any time, Circle or Tether can freeze assets in any address, right? They have the power to do that. And yet, their combined market caps are over $100 billion worth. And they're the biggest stable coins, right, um, in crypto. So, when looking at it through that lens, I really do wonder what the uptake on CBDCs is going to be like. Like, is the population just going to use them because they're way more convenient than the existing system? Are they going to become popular because of that? The government's going to obviously, and the, and the banks themselves are obviously going to inject a lot of liquidity into it to, 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 to get that liquidity network effect. So I think that's inevitable that we get these things. I think it's inevitable that these things are pretty dystopian and that are probably not going to be great for, for society. Um, but in terms of where Ethereum fits, yeah, they, they'll use the Ethereum technology because it's just there. It's open source for them to use. It's free for them to use. I wouldn't blame the Ethereum ecosystem or like the, or anyone for like working on Ethereum enabling this, which I've seen some people do, which I just find bizarre. Um, <laughs> really? But I, 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 yeah, I've seen, I've seen, especially the 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 Bitcoin maximalists. They said that they it's Vitalik's fault that that the the Brazilian central bank digital currency exists because he invented Ethereum. Okay, well, let's take that to its logical fault conclusion. That, that, exactly. That Vitalik invented <laughs> yeah. Ethereum too. Oh, yes, exactly. Right. So, um, you know, it, it's 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 a silly reasoning there, but yeah, I think they'll they'll choose Ethereum technology because it's just the standard. Standard, right and then i'll choose the erc20 token standard as well for the same reasons and then that it'll just all interoperate with the ethereum public ledger which has been my thesis for ethereum for a long time that it's going to be the sediment layer for all types of value it doesn't matter if it's a cbdc or otherwise it's going to exist as that layer and that's where ethereum as a network uh benefits well we've got more to talk about anthony uh coming up i want to pick your brain on what DeFi protocols you are looking at this is a, a question from the nation actually addressed to you. Also, the entire world, it feels like, thinks crypto is a scam. Is there anything we can do to change that? I want to pick your brain on that as well. But before we do that, got to shout out the fantastic sponsors that made this episode possible, including our friends over at MetaMask, who want you to go check out the MetaMask dashboard. If you have a MetaMask wallet, you can view all of your assets in their portfolio. It's portfolio.metamask.io. Go check it out. MetaMask has something new. Introducing MetaMask Portfolio. MetaMask Portfolio is the best way to view your crypto portfolio from a holistic level. See everything across all the chains all at once. In your portfolio, MetaMask will report the aggregate value of all the assets in your MetaMask wallets and even the other wallets you import too. But MetaMask Portfolio isn't just a passive portfolio viewer. It is a place to do all of the money verbs that make DeFi so powerful. You can buy, swap, bridge, and stake your crypto assets. So not only is MetaMask the easiest place to see your wallets in aggregate, but it's also a powerful battle station for all of your DeFi moves. So go check out your MetaMask portfolio because it's waiting for you to open it up. Check it out at portfolio.metamask.io. Are you planning to launch a token? Is your token already live? And are you granting your employees and contractors vesting token awards? And are you trying to figure out how to take care of taxable events for your team? Toku makes implementing a global token incentive award simple. With Toku, you will get unmatched legal and tax support to grant and administer your global team's tokens. Toku will help you navigate across the life cycle of your token from easy to use pre-launch token grant award templates to managing post-cliff taxable events with payroll. For legal, finance, and HR teams, it's a huge complex task to have to comply with labor laws, payroll and tax obligations, tax reporting and crypto regulations in every country that you employ someone. It's difficult, time consuming, manual and costly, and it's drawing more attention from global regulators and governments. Toku makes it simple for leading companies in the space, Protocol Labs, Hedera, Gitcoin and many more. If you want some help navigating the complex world of token compliance, go to toku.com slash bankless or click the link in the description below. Here's a question from the nation this week. Uh, Sassel mentions, that's you, of course, Anthony. Uh, mm -hmm. Sassel mentions newer DeFi protocols that he's been looking into. Which ones does he mean and what makes them new and innovative compared to the blue chip DeFi protocols? This is Jay Miles looking for some Anthony Sassano alpha here. Uh, <laughs> what DeFi protocols are you looking at? Or maybe if that's too specific, what sort of trends are interesting at this point in time? 
Yeah, so generally the the trends I would say are things like oracleless protocols, so protocols that just do not have oracles involved in them at all, like a Uniswap style protocol, for example. Uniswap doesn't use oracles; uh, it works without them, which is which is pretty cool. So that's one thing I'm paying a lot of attention to. There is um, a, a company that I invested in recently that's launching. I think they're launch, they're launching today actually called Ajna Finance, which are doing an oracleless lending protocol. So essentially trying to disrupt the Aves and uh, compounds of the world and trying to do that without oracles and with very uh, kind of like minimal governance and things like that, uh, or, or basically no governance for, for a lot of things. So that, that kind of trend there I'm, I'm paying close attention to, because if we can make protocols work without oracles, that removes a, a centralization vector. Not to say that that the or oracles are bad and we, we definitely need them for a lot of things. Um, they're definitely real world assets. We would do that. We can't really remove it in, in that kind of um, realm from what I've seen, but that's one trend that I'm paying very very, very close attention to. Another one is new AMM designs. So I know that Uniswap V4 just got announced, um, and that's a pretty broad design, but uh, and, and a pretty pretty exciting design. But there are other protocols being built right now. I'm, I I don't think I can I can name any of them off, off the top of my head right now. I think a few of them are in, in stealth, but. They're basically designing AMMs in a very different way to what we what we're used to. They're building them from the ground up in order to be fully generalized and modular to give the liquidity provider as much control over the you know their the liquidity as possible. So that to me like has been done in in various ways. Obviously, Uniswap V3 did it with concentrated liquidity. Now they have V4 with their hooks, um, which they're basically trying to modularize it even further. But some of the protocols, other protocols I've been looking at, are taking it even further than that. Basically and making it so generalized that it just provides a lot more value to the liquidity provider itself. So those are some of the, the things that I'm, I'm paying um, close attention to. In, in generally as well, like I guess you could call these DeFi protocols, but I call them StakeFi. So things like Eigenlayer, of course, with restaking and uh, newer LST protocols that maybe are trying to do something a bit different than the older ones, those sorts of things I'm interested in as well. Uh, and, and yeah, that, that's, what, that's basically in the kind of DeFi sphere what I'm, what I'm looking at right now. Yeah, those are uh, some good takes. I'm a plus one on on kind of the Oracle list protocols. We did an episode with um, Dan um, Elitzer from uh, Nascent on the on Oracle list protocols that uh, folks should go check out as well. Um, more money Legos to build here. Really, that's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. A lot more De DeFi innovation needs to happen. Here's another question about account abstraction. There's been a lot of talk late last year about account abstraction, the beginning of this one from the subject, but um, things seem to have cooled down. How needed is account abstraction? What are some projects working on this front? Can you remind us what account abstraction is? And then um, tell us, has there been any movement lately on it or has it cooled down? Yeah. Um, so basically, account abstraction refers to this ability to create these Ethereum wallets that basically have superpowers, right? So essentially, they're sometimes referred to as things like smart contract wallets, um, where basically you can have controls in place like whitelists uh, directly on the wallet itself. So not so you can have whitelists on the, like your MetaMask wallet, for example, right? But with a smart contract wallet, you can have it inbuilt into your actual public-private key pair itself uh, as a smart contract. I mean, that's a crude analogy because smart contracts don't have, have kind of like private keys here. But um, from, from that kind of perspective, that's how, how it would work. And you could have like spending limits, things like that. You could do things like um, uh, uh, multiple kind of, uh, I guess, like string together transactions as well, so that you can do an approve and swap in one transaction instead of having to approve a token for swap and then click swap to do it. So in two diff different transactions, that I think is very powerful for people because how many times have we all gone to Uniswap and we've been like, oh, I have to approve this token and then I can swap it, right? So it's just, it's better on the UX side of things. Um, but in terms of like how much talk there's been, look, there, there is a lot of development happening in the background, but just by the very nature of what this is and how it's not really a speculative thing, you're not going to hear much about it unless you're actually looking for, for for news and updates on it because it is stuff that's happening in the background. It's at the infrastructure layer, but it is not infrastructure in the sense of a layer two or a layer one. It's more of like the middleware kind of protocols that you don't hear too much about. Like for example, there is um, the graph and chain link as well that are out there, but those things have have tokens, right? So you do hear about them sometimes. Whereas account abstraction, things like the wallet connects and, and Argent working on these things and, and people just working on standards, they don't have tokens attached to them. So there's no speculative attention. And generally they don't have much marketing because 
It's just infrastructure that's being built in the background for now. So there is still a lot of stuff happening, but what you'll see is a slow rollout to these different wallets because it is a change on the user facing stuff. So to change things for, for users, especially their wallet experience, you need to be slow and methodical with that. You need to make sure that the users aren't scared if you change something on them. That's why something like MetaMask is slow uh, is so slow to change. And they recently did a UI update actually, and I looked at it and I was like, oh, okay, this is this is new. And I, I looked at it, I'm like, okay, here's this, this, and this. But then that's me as a pro user. Imagine someone that's completely new um, using MetaMask for like a couple months and then it changes on them. So when it comes to wallets and integrating with account abstraction, they have to be very careful. They have to definitely do it as a gradual rollout, a slow rollout. So that's probably why you're not hearing too much about it. And generally when you hear something talked about a lot in, in like maybe a couple month period, it's because people are releasing all these new things that they've been working on and they're doing it at like major events such as ETH Denver as a, as a kind of marketing tool, so to speak. But generally, most of the time, you won't hear about these things unless you're actively looking looking for it. Be on the lookout, though, for these improved account abstraction wallets, smart contract wallets is, is sort of what you'll see. And the experience, if we get this right, should be very much like fintech. So ignore all kind of the gas fees and all of the multiple steps and transactions. Uh, it should feel very seamless. So I don't know. I think we're probably a year away, a year to like three years from this, going, like getting really good and polished, but the infrastructure is starting to be built. Um, some takes this week. Here's one, a take about the, the Fink effect here. Um, post BlackRock Forbes, so of course, Larry Fink and BlackRock came out in favor of crypto and Bitcoin. Um, this, this poster says, Bitcoin suddenly has become greener, helps third world countries, and it's not being used by baddies anymore. You love to see it. And the, the post links all bunch of articles, everything you need to know about Bitcoin and the environment, how Bitcoin helps civilians escape the war in Sudan, Bitcoin network to reduce more emissions than its energy sources produce. All right. That, the idea here is, uh, of course, once big finance and big Wall Street gets on it, Larry Fink, the, the BlackRock CEO, nothing could be bigger. Then mysteriously, the narrative in mainstream media begins to turn pro crypto. Is there anything to this? What do you think? I mean, yeah, I guess like it, Lex is probably cherry picking here, to be honest, at the same time, like, but, it, and, and to, 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 to call something a trend, I think you have to have longer than maybe like a few weeks of, of data, but there is something to media organizations changing their tune based on different trends, right? Because at the, at the end of the day, they're for-profit organizations. They don't want to be going against something that's going to you know, lose them money or lose them clicks or things like that. Uh, so so yeah, they're definitely going to, to probably align themselves more closely with these things. And at the end of the day, they could be doing this as well as a way just to ride another trend of the public <laughs> having a more favorable view. But in reality, they don't carry the way. They're just going to publish whatever gets them the most clicks. So I don't know. I don't have very much faith in mainstream media that's for sure <laughs> yes uh you do, one wonders whether it's more can buy algorithms at, at this point and whether you know this is kind of mm -hmm. new ideas being created um okay so one other um take this week i want to ask you about so this was actually somewhat controversial um i said this it's embarrassing that even my crypto friends use venmo not crypto to split a dinner we, and we have to change that this cycle we can't guilt people into it um, we have to make crypto wallets so useful they're irresistible. This is that idea of account abstraction that we were just talking about. It's like, where's the crypto wallet? Where like we mm -hmm. can, I don't care about paying at Starbucks necessarily because that requires like some like a Starbucks point of sale type system. All right. I'm just talking about you're, you're with a bunch of crypto natives, right? And you just had a dinner and you're going to go um, split the bill or something like that. And it's a peer to peer transaction. And I find myself still using fintech tools for that, still using Venmo. And I wish that wasn't the case. Here's part of the, maybe the, the controversy. DC Investor says, it's possible small P2P payments like this are not a value prop of public blockchains in most societies. In fact, I'd argue they are not, even though the narrative was popular for a long time, starting with Bitcoin. And he's basically saying, actually, P2P isn't the use case that uh, crypto is focused on. It should be the more kind of the large, you know, amount, like store of value would be more of a use case, uh, for instance, or, you know, collateralized loans or, or something like that. And, and P2P microtransactions will be one of the last things we solve. I get that, but I still want my account abstraction crypto wallet. Like, why am I still banked here? I want, I want to be bankless, Anthony. What's your take on this? Mm-hmm. 
I think really I agree with DC in the short term and disagree in the long term. I think P2P payments are a value prop of of blockchains generally, but at the same time, we're just way too early still. Um, there doesn't exist a, a wallet right now that would be able to do this right in a in a cheap way, in an efficient way, um, and also. At the end of the day, the reason we have dollars in a bank account still, we have money in a bank account, is because crypto is not integrated with many real world things. You can't pay a lot of things uh, in crypto, right? So when that changes, it'll be uh, people will have crypto on hand, right, for everyday expenses, and they'll be able to do that Venmo payment at dinner or that you know Venmo like payment at dinner. So I think it really just comes down to building out that infrastructure, getting it more integrated with the real world, and then eventually we hit a tipping point where people are like, oh well, you know why. Why would I use this old world money when I can use this new world money, so to speak, right? Um, and yeah, it's going to take a while. It's it's definitely more of an end stage crypto adoption thing rather than an early stage. And um, it's going to require a lot of work to, to get there. That's why I said I disagree. At, sorry, I agree with DC Investor in the short term, disagree uh, long term. Uh, I know people have, you know, will sometimes say, well, it's been like 15 years since Bitcoin's been out and we still don't have P2P payments. It's like, yeah, because Bitcoin isn't suited for it, right? Ethereum layer one is not suited for it. Ethereum layer twos are just getting started now. Um, stable coins, are, uh, you know, uh, in terms of being used for uh, uh, at, at scale on Ethereum, they're not that old, right? Um, and the infrastructure obviously is getting better all the time, but at the end of the day, we're still super early. I think we're we're, we're still way too early for the world that, that that you want, Ryan. Unfortunately, but it's a world that I want as well. But I think it'll come with time. That's cool. And you know, I, you're talking about like you know, it's been it's been 15 years, right? Why why don't we have this? You know what we do have though, and this is sort of um, I I was reminded by this after I tweeted. It's actually the a uh, project manager at PayPal, product manager at PayPal. Um, he he sent me after this. He DM'd me and he's like. Yo, you know, we could do this crypto thing in Venmo. And he just sent me 0.005 ETH in Venmo as if to say like, yo, we got this, like we can do this too. And um, he has a you know dot ETH name. So this is somebody who is uh, clearly crypto pilled inside the company at PayPal and Venmo building this out. And so it was kind of cool in my Venmo app in FinTech to receive some ETH. And of course, like it's an IOU. Um, but mm -hmm. I, uh, for ETH, right, it's custody, it's not fully bankless, so it's not the full vision. But we have gotten to this stage in 15 years, and Venmo and PayPal have, I don't know, hundreds of millions, 400 million or something um, customers worldwide. That's absolutely massive progress that we're able to do this. And recently, I think it was within the last six to 12 months, Venmo has also enabled the ability to withdraw to a bankless, non custodial address, which is a big step. So now we also have an off ramp from these systems. Anyway, I was uh, we were sending money back and forth, and um, I'm at the stage where I'm trying to get uh, AML KYC'd, of course, mm -hmm. in order to send him back the money on his uh, on his bankless address, and I'm almost there. Um, but look, man, that's progress. That's very cool. The the original, I don't know, back in 2013 or back when you started getting into uh, Bitcoin, Anthony. Imagine being able to buy a crypto native asset in a fintech tool and send that to a friend, even if it's fully custodianed. Like that is progress, and you know, I think I think we're getting there. We're just in this weird interim phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely is progress. I mean, as you said, it is custodial, so it's like the easy way of doing this, so to speak, because you can just run a ledger in the background, and there's no need to do on-chain transactions for this. So it's just it's like a centralized exchange, right? It's um, a side chain. But at this yeah, well, yeah, essentially it's a side chain to Ethereum, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But yeah, I guess the dream that you were referencing in your other tweet was the fully bankless, non-custodial payments. Be we'll be, we'll get there. We'll get there eventually. But yeah, I still think it's 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 too early, unfortunately. I don't, know. I don't <laughs> want to be doing this podcast with you in like five to ten years and still not there yet. All right, like we gotta. Yeah, yeah. I, I want this to move. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, a last question I have for you this week as we uh, bring this to a wrap is um, another question I put out on Twitter. The world thinks crypto is a scam. How do we change that perception? Uh, what's your take on this, Anthony Sassano? Um, this idea that crypto is a scam, obviously you and I disagree. Most listeners will mm -hmm. also disagree, but um, the world thinks it is. How do we change that? So I really think it's a it's perception at the end of the day, right? Like 
there are so many scams in the world that aren't perceived as scams because they are marketed in such a way that convinces the general populace that they are not a scam. And you could stretch the definition of scam to meet a lot of different criteria, right? But there are certain things that people say are scams. Like, so let's say uh, student loans in the US, they're predatory. Uh, you know, they have high, uh, high interest rates. They lock people in for a very long time. And people can, some people consider them a scam, right? But uh, then there are other things that uh, may may also look like a scam, but no one's calling it a scam because they've been able to successfully market themselves as not a scam. And I think when it comes to crypto, we both believe it's not a scam, and it, and we and we obviously there are scams in crypto. But so how do we change that perception? And I think that it's a very a tough task to do because there is no centralized marketing for crypto, right? There is no crypto overlord that says, this is the way we're going to market crypto to the masses. At the end of the day, it's a very disjointed ecosystem, a very decentralized ecosystem that has different uh, sectors to it. Some people will never you know, pay attention to uh, certain assets, but pay attention to other ones or pay attention to certain sectors and not other ones. Some people will spend all their time in NFTs, but not look at DeFi at all, for example, right? Um, and and let's say you're in NFTs and you get rugged a bunch of times. You're like, you're going to throw up your hands and be like, oh my God, crypto is all a scam, you know, screw this, right? So I, I think it is just a perception thing at the end of the day. So how do we change that perception? I don't have a good answer to that. And I was reading through the replies and I'm like, it's kind of funny reading the replies. I was thinking the whole time, I'm like, there are so many different replies that it speaks to exactly what I was saying that because there is no central overlord dictating the narrative or dictating the marketing, you're going to get all these different replies that imply different things. And there's not going to be a, a kind of like correct answer here. So I don't have a good answer for this, but I think that people should read through the replies on your tweet to get the different answers and to get the different perspectives here. Uh, but generally, if 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 you kind of held the gun to my head and said like okay you have to answer this you have to have a take on this i would say let's just keep building right let's just keep building keep building products people want to use that actually provide value and eventually if we build things that enough people use and it it, it should change that perception and change the narrative in the the minds of the masses um but uh but yeah even in that world it it may not right it may not be a, a thing it may it may not happen for a lot longer after we do that but yeah we'll have to see how that plays out so we just need the builders to build and then we just need some time and your other message is, uh, hey, scam is in the eye of the beholder, <laughs> right? And, well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is though, because like there are legit scams in crypto that people don't think are scams. And I'm like, that's just literally a scam, dude. Like it's pretty obviously a scam. And they're like, no, it's not, it's not a scam. I can't okay, tell sometimes. Well, sometimes in crypto, I feel like we overuse the term scam and other times I feel we, like we, we do. don't use it enough. Other times I'm like, well, yes. no, we should call these things out. Uh, so I, I just don't even know how I feel about that, but um. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. We definitely have a narrative problem right now, but of course we will when prices are down. Uh, let's get to the meme of the week here. This is a tweet from a Spreck. Crypto company announcement translation guide uh, in one column. Today is my last day. I'm excited to spend more time with family and working on new projects. What that really means is I'm quitting because of massive fraud and looming legal actions. Here's another one. What it means if you're looking for the translation. We're excited to announce our expansion to insert island nation state. What that really means is we are under investigation by the CFTC. Uh, we are excited to announce our expansion to the UK. That me really means is we are <laughs> under investigation by the SEC. I love this. All right. What decentralization actually means. Founders and investors are ready to dump their tokens on you. Wow. That is, um, uh, I think, a um, you know, a negative take, of course. But, uh, well, that's where we are in the market cycle. So I, f I found this funny. That's your meme of the week this week. Um, Anthony, the Daily Gway keeps on popping out videos. I'm going to give you a shout out. This is the Daily Gway. Way YouTube channel. So if you are listening to this on um, a podcast, you got to go look up the Daily Gway in your podcast feed. You can get episodes daily, right, Anthony? I mean, this is the Daily Gway, of course. And if you're watching Every this, day, yep. If you're watching this on YouTube, you got to go over to the Daily Gway channel and hit subscribe. Anthony, uh, you do the fantastic episode every day that is um, technical, that is Ethereum focused. That is absolutely fantastic to get a refuel on everything that is going on in the Ethereum economy. Um, it's a it's a fantastic place to go. And Anthony, I want to thank you 
for doing so many episodes with David and myself on the roll-up. David should be back starting next week. He is up on a mountain. This is him climbing Baker <laughs> Mountain. Uh, he's doing three mountains, and uh, he'll be back next week. But, Anthony, you've done a killer job in helping David and I manage some vacation and keep these roll-ups going. So uh, we definitely appreciate you. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the shout outs. And yeah, thanks for having me on. It's always really fun being on these on these roll ups and talking to to you and David. Uh, you guys uh, have a, a great perspective on things. And I think that I I, I really like the back and forth uh, instead of just talking to the camera on my own a lot of the time. Right. I, I love the back and forth with, with people. So yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Well, guys, uh, thank you for listening to the Bankless Roll Up. Got to end with this. Our typical risks and disclaimers. Crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot.